Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. In each episode, I'm Dr. Jill, your host, and I will interview leading experts in biology, chemistry, human physiology, and optimal performance. Join us as we connect with renowned experts in each of these fields, innovators and leaders at the forefront of medical research and practice. We're here to empower you with knowledge and important information for human transformation. One of my goals is to aid you on your journey to optimal health. And today I am so excited to introduce my guest, Dr. Habib. I'm going to read his bio in just a moment, but today the topic is vagus nerve. Now, you have had your head in the sand if you have not heard the term vagus nerve or heard about vagus nerve. It is all over social media. It's all over so many of the places we, we go. And the reason is it's time has come. And we will dive into, if you don't even know where that bit, where that nerve is in your body or what it has to do with your health, we're going to dive in and talk to the expert today. But let me go ahead and introduce him. Dr. Naviz Habib is a best-selling author of Activate Your Vagus Nerve, which I have right here. We will talk about that later too. And the newly released Upgrade Your Vagus Nerve. He also is the host of the Health Upgrade podcast. After graduating as class valedictorian from Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College in 2010, he went on to practice traditional chiropractic for years until he utilizes utilize the power of functional medicine to transform his own health. And hopefully we'll hear, hear a little bit about that journey today. Dr. Habib is the founder of Health Upgraded, an online functional health consulting clinic supporting optimal health by elevating the awareness and function of the vagus nerve. Welcome, Dr. Habib. So glad to have you here. An absolute pleasure, Dr. Jill. Uh, really excited about this. Me too. We've been running into each other at different conferences, and um, you gave me a copy of your book a while back. I was so excited because, again, this is really an important topic. Um, I am super excited to dive in. Uh, but before we do, I always like to start with my guest story as far as how did you get into medicine, chiropractic, and then how did you get into the interest in the vagal nerve? And it sounds like you have a story. I absolutely do have a story. You kind of alluded to it with the introduction there, but my story, uh, a little bit similar to yours and very similar to a lot of people that are in kind of that functional space. We tend to have our own health struggle and that's, uh, I'm, I'm no different from that. I uh, remember very clearly I was in my 20s in chiropractic college and I was significantly overweight. I weighed 250 pounds. I was dealing with high blood pressure. I was borderline diabetic in my 20s. Like these are wow. things that we don't want people to experience when they're in their 40s, 50s, 60s. And I was dealing with this in my 20s. And it had a lot to do with stress. It had a lot to do with um, habits that we just were fully unaware that I was indulging in and creating. And it had a lot to do with a lot of the things that I didn't realize were affecting me. I was really interested in gaining the knowledge of what health was but the implementation piece was very difficult for me. And that really was the challenge. And so when I got to that end point, I was 250 pounds and multiple diagnoses were headed in my direction. And the doctors were saying, you know, there's medications and here's a prescription. And I said, I'm not comfortable with this. I need to solve this for myself. Once I graduated from chiropractic college, I really made the decision to figure out what was truly going on, what was happening inside my body. And I was introduced to the idea of functional medicine a couple of years in by a wonderful colleague and mentor of mine, Sachin Patel, who okay. helped to introduce me to this entire world and to actually teach me what health really meant. Not simply the absence of disease, but the function and the drive towards optimal health okay. and optimal function. And that was the kicker for me. That was the the inciting incident where things really took a positive turn. I got some functional lab testing to identify that there were some issues of uh, I had some yeast in my uh, stools, uh, stool testing. I had some pretty significant uh, challenges on some uh, organic acid testing. And this testing really gave me this understanding from a cellular perspective and from a microbiome perspective, what was going wrong. This led me to look into inflammation because this was that inciting challenge that was causing the inflammation within my body. And that inflammation created a cascade of not being able to handle the stress effectively. And that led to me putting on weight and me having these health struggles that were occurring. And so I thought about this and I got to this depth of 
well, what is this inflammation and why is my body having difficulty controlling this inflammation? The answer came down to me with my history and looking into uh, kind of brain function, nervous system function, particularly while I was going through chiropractic college. And it came down to the vagus nerve as being the nerve that controls inflammation. And that was the inciting moment when I ended up losing a bunch of that weight and getting rid of a lot of these health challenges that I was dealing with. I was finally able to actually move forward with my health, but understand that that was this one pathway that was truly meant to control inflammation in my body throughout the entirety of my body. It wasn't an organ specific. It wasn't a system specific challenge. It was a holistic approach to creating this inflammatory control piece and to adjust and make a massive change in my health. Wow. What a story. And, um, uh... So many things come to mind. One is just the fact of I really love, I love what we're going to talk about today, which is the vagus nerve and some of the tools that you have given in your book and other things, devices that we're going to talk about. Um, but I also love the fact of it takes a whole body approach, right? Like I've always been, a, in fact, it took me a while to uh, adopt like vagal nerve stimulators, which we're going to talk about one of my favorites today. Um, so stay tuned. If you're looking at what's the best vagal nerve stimulator, you will find out by the end of this podcast. But I want to say that for a long time, I was a little resistant because I thought, oh, how do we just go externally and stimulate the vagus nerve, right? And not take care of the internal stuff. And so I really love that you have both. And I know in your book, um, Activate the Your Vagus Nerve, um, you talk a lot about these other things, right? This foundation. I want to talk about that today. But before we do, I want to delve just a little bit into the psychology of your childhood. You don't have to go super deep if you don't want to, but I just think people out there can relate to gosh, I'm overweight. I don't feel well. And that feeling of whether it was like helplessness or I'll just be this way, or maybe my family's this way, or were there any of those messages that you had to overcome in your own life due to your upbringing or your environment? Because I just think there's so many people that can relate to like the kid in high school that was, they felt ugly or or stupid or overweight. And, and we all have those things, even the most, you were valedictorian like me, even us, right? So share a little bit about what your journey was with what you're comfortable with. I had a very comfortable upbringing. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents were wonderful, very supportive, very helpful. I grew up in a suburb, uh, suburban mm -hmm. home just outside of Toronto, still live in Toronto or just okay. outside of it. I'm uh, very, it was a very calm, very comfortable environment. I found that a lot of the stress came from myself and having really high expectations of myself. Yes. <laughs> it was, in, uh, my parents had very little to do with it. I think maybe on the fitness side of things, they weren't heavily engaged in physical activity nearly as much. My mom worked as a nuclear medicine technologist in uh, a hospital nearby here forever and yeah. had a very physical job. So there wasn't a lot that she wanted to do physically when she got home. There was not a lot of exercise. My dad was a computer guy, so sitting was his uh, hobby, yeah. and we just never got into the exercise piece. Got and they it. did get me into swimming. I was I was really involved in swimming and lifeguarding, but once I got to a point uh, where I was kind of on my own and able to do things, that's when the issues really kicked off for me. And I, I realized it had a lot to do with the pressure I put on myself. Got it. I love that because wonderful childhood, wonderful parents, and we can have, I have the same exact situation, but there is that like, maybe it's just that internal drive, which allowed you to transform to that puts us, well, you were clearly a valedictorian. So <laughs> there was, right. There was that piece of like achievement, which is nothing wrong. It makes us so successful. But I think that pressure sometimes from inside out can actually be a massive stressor. I mean, it's a motivator, but a stressor. So how do we yes. transform that into this optimal health and healing, which is exactly what you did. You took that same motivation and said, okay, how do I transform myself? So um, what was the first inkling that, okay, I don't like how I look or how I feel or these diagnoses I'm getting. Um, what was your first, do you remember when you first thought, oh, maybe I could change this or what do I need to do? Or what was that moment that shifted for you? I met my wife uh, right before I graduated from chiropractic college. It was maybe a few months and um, it was a year into our marriage. We remember doing this because both of us had our own health struggles, weight related and whatnot. And we were sitting down. It was just after our first anniversary. And we said, this is not the way we want to live. Like if we want to have kids, we don't want them to deal with the same health struggles that we were dealing with. And so for me, for my wife, we made a commitment to search for answers and to really sit down and do this together. 
And luckily enough, we had one another to rely on. We had accountability. We had this desire to to pass on good habits to our children. And now we have two daughters who are growing wonderfully. They're still quite young, but they are, uh, I'm hoping, in much better shape and and have a wonderful trajectory towards a, a healthy life. What a great legacy. Now, you just hit on something I think is so critical for vagal tone and for overall health, and that is companionship, partnership, um, connection with human beings, right? Let's just dive into that because you had this spouse that was like, okay, together, we're going to get this goal accomplished. And then you guys were like there for one another. And probably when one was down, the other was up and like, okay, you can do it. That's so powerful with behavioral change because so many of you out there are wanting to do this. And if you are alone, this is why health coaches and trainers and physicians and all kinds of people in our life are so valuable because sometimes we just need, I'll tell you a perfect example from my life is I was going to write a book years and years ago. And I had this um, writer who came to say, could I help you with this? I said, well, I don't want a copywriter. I want to write my own book. Um, But as he kept pestering me and pestering me and pestering me, I'm like, oh, I think this might be really good because I need someone to bother me for deadlines and like accountability. I literally hired him. He was the, you know, writing coach. And so I said, I want to write the book. I need your help, but I need, so it was like that. I, I hired accountability in this case and it helped me finish the book. And for me, that was so powerful in that change of like, okay, I want to get this thing done. I need someone to help me on the way. So if you're out there listening and like want to change your health or your life or your finances, accountability is a beautiful thing. Maybe get someone, friend, family, partner, spouse to help you in that journey. Now, because that's related to vagal tone, how does connection and companionship affect the vagal nerve? I'm glad we started here because this is rarely where I start. This is a really wonderful conversation so far. Um, Loneliness is huge. It is a major driver for stress internally and self-derived psychological stress. This is that loneliness, that, that constant, uh, having standards that are so high for ourselves that we wouldn't have standards nearly as high for our friends or for our loved ones cause a lot of uh, dysfunction internally. And it comes down to this idea of the polyvagal theory. I'm going to dig into Stephen Porges's topic here. So for those who don't know what this is, this uh, Stephen Porges years ago uh, developed this theory called the polyvagal theory. And it comes down to the fact that our vagus nerves in a psychology standpoint will start to work only when we experience safety. Mm. And safety comes from feeling not alone, feeling like we are comforted, feeling like we are supported, feeling like we are with people around us. And this is, uh, interestingly, if we look into the uh, the blue zones, the blue zones all have a very strong sense of community involved. That community involvement, that, con- that accountability, that Uh, communal comfort that occurs there creates a sense of safety. And safety then is the major driver from a psychology standpoint to turn on the vagus nerve. This is so important to understand because if we don't feel safe, our bodies go into a a sympathetic state more readily. And so we'll get into what this means, but the vagus nerve controls one half of the autonomic nervous system. It's the rest, digest, and recover system system that's pushed through the vagus nerve. On the opposite side of this, we have the sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight, as we constantly know about it. And the fight or flight system is a necessary tool. It's the accelerator in your car. You have to push the accelerator to be able to make the car move. You have to go places. But constantly having that accelerator pushed all the time without the ability to push the brakes and slow that down actually creates a danger to society. It creates a danger to those around us and to ourselves. And so we have to have this balance between the accelerator and the brakes. So the brakes are the vagus nerve and that parasympathetic branch to this autonomic nervous system. And this controls all of the internal functions within our body that we aren't consciously thinking about. So I'm not consciously thinking about my liver detoxing at the moment or my intestines creating peristaltic motion for my lunch right? All of these things are automatically happening. And so this control of that autonomic system has to occur uh, through these two branches, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Safety drives the parasympathetic system to turn on, to be able to go into that state for the brakes to be pushed effectively. When we feel unsafe, when we feel alone, when we feel challenged, when we feel stressed, 
we push far more easily into that sympathetic state. And so the accelerator gets pushed more than we want it to. And that drives inflammation. And that drives an uncontrolled level of inflammation, which can then down the road turn to disease. And so we have to look at it from a psychology standpoint, but also from other stressors that can come up. And we can get into those as we go. What a, a beautiful, beautiful explanation and just practical break in accelerator. I love that with the autonomic system and the vagal nerve. It makes it so easy to understand. One thing that comes to mind um, with really regards to sympathetic is you may be out there listening and wanting to get well from a lot of my listeners, Lyme disease, mast cell activation, mold, gut issues, tons of Crohn's and colitis and IBS, and then cognitive issues or long COVID. And I could go on and on and on. These are just some of the most common things that I see. But one of the things I've seen over my 20 years in functional medicine is, and I'm sure I want your comment on this is. I know the practical ways to change with nutrition and supplements and diet and lifestyle and all these things. And I always talk about clean air, clean water, clean food. But what I've learned more than ever in the last five years, maybe 10 years, is if someone does not feel safe in their own body, if they feel like their body's betraying them because they got a disease, if they feel like they're a victim, if they feel unsafe, like they don't have the tools or resources to get well, or they don't have the knowledge or whatever it is, they will never, there's no amount of great protocol that I can have, great testing, all these things we have that will allow them to get well and they'll get stuck. And so I started to see in, in clinical practice is these patients that they're doing all the right things and they're trying so hard and they're type A like you and I, you know, they're just like, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. But they're in that state of what do you want me to do? I want to get well. I want to get well. I want to get well. I want to get well quicker. I just yesterday had this guy who's every time, how quickly can I get well? And I'm like, oh, every time I'm talking to him, I'm like, calm down, be in your body, let your body heal. There's no time. I mean, we will get there, but if you put that pressure on yourself, so let's talk a little bit about that because um, you alluded to it, but I want to talk specifically about why is it that the body cannot heal without this sense of safety inside? It's a great question. And, and it really comes down to, are we pushing the accelerator? Are we pushing the brakes? And where are those signals going? So we'll come to the vagus nerve because it is heavily linked here. And I think it's a great connecting point. It's called the vagus nerve. It is the 10th cranial nerve. And I'm saying is uh, that it is as if it's one. There's actually two of them. So they come out of the brainstem. It's the 10th cranial nerve. We have 12 pairs of cranial nerves that come out of our brainstem going primarily to our head face area. And they do the sensation and the autonomic nervous system control of the head and face area. But the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve, only has a couple of connections in the head and face. It actually comes out. And it's the only nerve of those cranial nerves that comes out of the cranial cavity of the head area comes down through the neck and it's literally located beside the carotid artery and the jugular vein in your neck. So when you go and you find your pulse in your neck, you're actually within a few millimeters of your vagus nerve, very, very close, very accessible. And those three tissues, those three uh, fibers are actually held together in an area called the carotid sheath. They're actually protected together. The blood vessel that takes blood to your brain, your carotid artery, the jugular vein, which brings the blood down from your brain to your body, and the vagus nerve on both sides of your body are held together in this safety zone of your neck. That then continues down. The vagus nerve uh, on the right and the left come together. They actually intertwine and they connect to essentially every organ within the body. They have connections to the heart which is very important. We'll talk a little bit about heart rate variability. The lungs, very important. Go down the esophagus, the stomach, the gallbladder, the kidneys. There's indirect connection to the spleen, the intestines, primarily the small, but a portion of the large intestine as well. We have essentially every organ getting a direct connection via the vagus nerve. And we really have to go and say, well, why is it this way? They called it the vagus nerve because it was wandering. It was a very vague uh, path that it was taking throughout the body. That's what an anatomist went to it and said, this is really vague. Let's call it the vagus nerve. Uh -huh. And so the aptly named vagus nerve, we tried to figure out what it does. Well, 80% of the information on the vagus nerve is actually coming from those organs and going up to the brain. 80%, wow. the vast majority of what we think 
when it comes to nerves is it goes from head to body, right? The brain to body connection. But what's happening within the body needs to be relayed to the brain. And that's where the connection of the vagus nerve is really, really intense. And the signals that are coming up come from the microbiome. Yeah. They come from the stomach. They come from the heart. They come from the blood vessels in certain areas, particularly the carotid artery. They come from the lungs and we're sending these signals up to the brain. And what they're sending are status updates telling us what's happening. And it's not all of the cells in the uh, in those organs sending those signals up. It's the immune system cells, the immune cells that are located in each of those organs. The immune system is everywhere. Yes. We often think of a system as a specific set of organs or a specific functional uh, organ type, but immune cells are located in every single organ of the body. They are actually the conductor and choreographer of all of the optimal function of each of those organs. Those immune cells are sending uh, signals up to the brain. And then the relay is to go back down to those immune cells to tell those immune cells, are we under stress or not? And what to do about it, how to coordinate that control. So the 15% of information that comes from the brain to those organs will then send signals to the immune cells to say, yes, we are not stressed, we are safe. Let's drive optimal function during this time. When that signal decreases is because we're under some sort of inflammatory stress that's so chronic that it burns out that 15% of information that is being sent down there. And it's signaling to the immune system. And the immune system is the key function here. The vagus nerve is the connecting point between the brain, nervous system, and the immune system, which is located in every organ of the body. This is the best way to, to think about this. The signals that are being sent is that relay between immune system and, and brain. And so understanding immune function and understanding how the immune system is going to turn on and turn off comes down to that safety signal. Are we turning on safety or are we turning off safety? And when we turn off safety, we go into a sympathetic state and the vagus nerve stops working effectively. Wow, brilliant. Um I want to make this real practical and then we're going to dive into what can we do about the vagus nerve. But my thought is I have so many listeners and more and more prevalence of mast cell activation. You guys yeah. don't know what that is. Um, it basically our primordial cells, part of the immune system are overacting and creating a, a throwing out histamine and prostaglandins and things. And people are having tachycardia, heart rate increase, skin issues, brain issues, gut permeability issues. And I could name 101 other symptoms because it affects all systems, but this is connected, right? Because mast cells, feel like there's a threat, whether it's a virus or an environmental threat like mold or any number of things that are toxin or infection affecting the immune system saying, this is not safe. This is a dangerous situation or even loneliness, right? And then patients are getting these mass activations at unprecedented rates. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying that if we could actually tone our vagal nerve and actually uh, allow our body to feel safe by doing what we're going to talk about, what the exercises for the vagus nerve, we might actually be able to decrease mast cell activation or other immune dysfunction, right? Absolutely. 100%. So the signal that's being sent via the vagus nerve is sent through a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine and acetylcholine has receptor sites on all of these immune cells on macrophages, which are kind of the big eater cells of the immune system on the T cells, on the B cells, and on all of the mast cells. The mast cells being the histamine releasers, the prostaglandin releasers. These are the eosinophils, the basophils, the uh, neutrophils. These guys send out these signals to create a reaction internally. And that reaction that's created is in response to not getting enough acetylcholine to block that reaction because the, un understandably, our body feels like it's under threat. It's under threat from pet dander, or it's under threat from gluten, or it's under threat from some sort of toxin that's not allowing for safety from a biochemical standpoint. And that's what triggers that reaction. And so we get a reaction like uh, asthma, right? An asthmatic reaction in the lungs is a histamine reaction. It's an asthmatic mast cell activation. That's the same idea as what happens in the intestinal walls. It's the same idea as what happens in every organ that has some sort of mast cell activation and acetylcholine from the vagus nerve and from other sources that are signaled via the vagus nerve will help to reduce that inflammatory burden and reduce the amount of mast cell activation that is occurring so we can lower histamine release. Oh, wow. So fascinating. 
So I want to talk about practical ways to address vagal nerve. And again, we're going to talk about vagal nerve stimulators, which is kind of an external way to stimulate that nerve right along here. But first of all, there's a lot of ways in our life that we can access and, and start to stimulate vagal nerve. Go through, you've got so many of them in your book here. Um, so if you want the full guide, go to um, activate your vagus nerve book or vagusnervebook.com. Is that right? That's right. Vagusnervebook.com. Vagus and get your copy. But Let's just talk through maybe the top 10 or so of ways that you can actually access this nerve and change its function. The number one, without a doubt, best way to do this is by controlling your breath. The breath is a tool that we actually have conscious control over, but will automatically occur when we're not consciously thinking about it, right? I'm not consciously thinking about being my heart, but that's going to happen. But when I'm not thinking about my breath, I'm still breathing. So there is an autonomic component to it. But we do have conscious control, which is very exciting because this is how we can think and actually create the change inside our body by adjusting how we are breathing. So there's three very important factors to whether you're breathing in a parasympathetic state or a sympathetic state, whether vagus nerve is being turned off or on. The three big factors, number one is, are you breathing through your nose or are you breathing through your mouth? We should be breathing through our nose. Our nose has nose hairs, which are an inborn filter for particulate matter. So we're not getting in particulate matter when we have good nose hair and it's blocking and filtering the air that's coming in. It's also then allowing for the uh, humidification of the air through the sinuses and the warming of the air as it gets down into the lungs. So we're not getting this shock of cold, unfiltered, um, dry air coming through our mouth. We're actually creating the right idea when we breathe through our nose. So nasal breathing, number one, is very, very important. Number two, we want it to be diaphragmatic. We want to breathe into our diaphragm. So many of us, and we can test it very quickly, put a hand on your chest, put a hand on your belly, and take three breaths. Check to see which hand is moving while you're taking these breaths. Is it the breath, or is it the hand that's on your chest, or is it the hand that's on your belly? As you inhale, you should feel that your belly is expanding and contracting, not your chest, a lot less on the chest. Both will, but we should feel the primary driver is the belly. And that's telling us that our diaphragm is doing the job of creating that inhale. Diaphragmatic, so nasal, number one, diaphragmatic breath. When we breathe with just our chest muscles and we have just our chest doing all the work, we're not getting a full inhale. We're not getting the prime driver of the breath working, which is the diaphragm. We're actually using accessory breathing muscles. And that's why a lot of people have very tight traps and tight upper back muscles. And it's not just because of our terrible posture of being on our phones and our laptops all the time. It actually has a lot to do with how we're breathing. So consider that one, look into that and, and assess, are you breathing diaphragmatically or are you breathing with your chest? And number three is exhale. How long is your exhale? So what's really interesting is we create a pattern in our breathing. When we inhale, it actually creates a pattern in our heart called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. So when we inhale, our heart rate increases slightly, but it does. Our hearts get our heartbeats get closer together. And as we exhale, our heartbeats spread apart ever so slightly. And what happens over time is as we do this, we create variability between the number of milliseconds between beats of our heart. And this is then measured as heart rate variability, HRV. So for anybody who has wearable devices out there, I've got my Aura Ring, I've had it for years. Whoop Band is great, Polar is a great tool, all of these great wearable tech devices, even Apple Watch now is quite good. These are all great at giving you an indication of your heart rate variability, which is the best way to measure vagus nerve function. When we breathe in, we bring these heartbeats closer together. When we breathe out and we exhale, we bring the beats further apart. And as we exhale, bringing the beats further apart creates more variability. And that is when we're turning on our vagus nerve. Exhale is the time to turn on our vagus nerve. So nasal, diaphragmatic, longer exhales. The three top things to do with your breath. So if we can focus on creating a breath pattern that is through our nose into our diaphragm and longer exhales, it'll actually create a whole shift in our breathing pattern that turns on the vagus nerve more readily, pushes our HRV up and actually increases our vagal tone. 
this is what we're trying to do when we breathe effectively. Oh, fantastic. And so practical. Um, it's interesting. You mentioned accessory muscles in our neck. I just heard an aesthetician talking at a conference and she was saying, one of the ways you can look at women in their age, cause they're doing the facial stuff is by looking to see if they have really tight accessory muscles. <laughs> and that's well, right. that's another good reason to anti-age is to breathe, right? Because then you're not going to have all these real tight accessory muscles in our that's Exactly right. <laughs> I like, that's a good anti-aging tip is breathe right. To, to it breathe is. Right. <laughs> 100%. Some people have this uh, concept it's actually something I learned from Satchin a long time ago, yeah. that we have a certain number of breaths that we're going to take throughout our lives. And if we can extend that longer, then we are likely to be able to extend our lifespan very interestingly. So oh. breathing less actually is better for you and will extend your life. Wow. So all these anti-aging tips as well. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Or I, I hate the word anti-aging because that means like we're not trying to age, aging well or optimal. Aging well and optimally. I yeah, like that. that's better because I'm, I'm all about aging well. I don't, I have any problem with my age or growing old or any of that. So um, what are a few other practical ways you mentioned connections? So obviously like getting with people, connecting with people, I'm sure hugs, all these kinds of things, but do you want to give out just a few practical tips in day-to-day -day life that might be helpful for vagal nerve? For sure. For sure. So connection is huge and that creates a sense of safety and we want to be around people that make us happy and when we're happy we tend to laugh laughter is one of those wonderful tools that we can use to create this optimal sense of well-being and safety we don't laugh when we're feeling scared right we laugh when we're feeling comforted when we're feeling safe when we're feeling happy i went to a comedy show with my wife this weekend which was wonderful we hadn't been able to do one for a while so we went, we laughed, it was great. And that's one of those things that you can do. So go out, find people that you can connect with, laugh with them. Uh, laughter yoga is something that if you're not really into the whole exercise and fitness piece, laughter yoga is one of those really interesting ways to start to incorporate this laughing piece into your day-to-day -day life. And it's a very easy thing to do. You literally do it with a few people one person just starts laughing and everybody ultimately ends up laughing for about 20 or 30 minutes. I've never liked yoga, but I think I would love laughter. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Oh, love it. Yeah, so that's a great one. Okay. Um, if we want to piggyback off of uh, the breathing pattern and the breathing tools, there's a bunch of tools that we can do on top of that. So there's humming. Humming is a really wonderful tool where we create a vocalization pattern within the laryngeal and pharyngeal muscles. For the math people out there, you might have noticed I talked about the vagus nerve and 80% of information comes up, 15% is that parasympathetic controlling info going down, there's 5% left. The motor signals to the muscles of the laryngeal and the pharyngeal branches that go down into the throat are vagus nerve motor branches. So 4% of that leftover comes down to the muscles around the throat. So humming, chanting, gargling, speaking, these are all ways to activate that 4% branches of vagus nerve. So these are great. And we do all of those while we are exhaling, right? So we're going to exhale, we're going to chant in an exhale pattern, we're going to hum in an exhale pattern. One of the reasons why we have this really interesting uh, ohm pattern that's been out since uh, ancient times, right? That ohm humming pattern that occurs from your throat that's actually a vagus nerve activating tool. Isn't that so cool? Yeah. It's kind of what it's been there for. When we extend the exhale, we create the vocalization all at the same time. Gargling, wonderful, particularly if you have digestive issues. Yeah. Gargling vigorously in the morning, in the evening, throwing a little bit of salt into your water. Great way to get that going because what it does is it forces you not to inhale the water forces you to activate the pharyngeal and laryngeal muscles really effectively. And it cleans up what's at the back of your throat while you're exhaling vigorously. That creates a sense of calm and safety. And it's a really great way to activate the vagus nerve. And it's I've found it to be particularly impressive in people that have digestive challenges, peristaltic issues, yeah. constipation, stuff like that. Wow. So practical. I want to get to vagal nerve stimulators, which we're Absolutely. about this guy, but I want to talk about a really quick story that just reminded me as you're talking. So one of the first stories in my book is about this climb that I did where I had literally my um, writing coach, we mentioned already, is also a professional climber. And one day we're doing um, a coffee shop session and he's like, Hey, do you want to go for a climb? And I'm just like up for adventures. So I'm sure that sounds like fun, <laughs> not knowing what I'm getting into and actually having zero climbing experience. So I went out, got shoes, we made it to the mountain, we climbed up and then I'm on the mountain, right? 
And I climbed the third flat iron, which for those of you who don't know, Boulder, it's like a thousand foot rampart. Like it's crazy that my first climb was a flat iron, but it comes back to vagal nerve because I remember being on that rock, my very first climb. Dr. Habib, I was terrified. Like I have never in my life been so scared, but I also was like, I want to do this. I want to achieve this. I want to, I know I can do it. And so I was in that mix of like, I didn't want to look back and be scared by how far down it was. I didn't want to look up and be like, there's no way I'll make it. But you know what I did on that rock so many times during that three and a half hours, I sang hymns to myself, old like stuff from my childhood. And I literally, I didn't even care. There's people, you know, climbing on their side of me, maybe hundred feet away. I sang to myself and I never knew it until recently talking about the vagus nerve and talking even about in utero in our mother's womb, that, that humming and that sound into like, mm, is like feeling almost like what, how we might've heard our mother humming if we, they, she was singing. And then also the fact that that probably, and I just thought as you're talking, I'm like, I bet you, I didn't know this, but I was self-soothing with vagal nerve stimulation on that mountain, right? <laughs> you absolutely were. That's absolutely 100% correct. You went back to a state that allowed for you to create safety. And so that humming sound, uh, bringing it back to polyvagal theory, Stephen Poor just uh, states very clearly that uh, mother's tone of voice is a major driver of this feeling of safety. And even while we're in utero, so humming calmly, right? When we speak calmly with our children, our children tend to respond in a much more calm state where when we are a little bit more activated and we're a little bit more aggressive, they tend to mirror that that same reaction. So what you were doing was self-soothing in the same way that your mother would have done while you were in utero. Very interesting. So amazing. Cause I had no idea until recently. I'm like, Oh, that's why. I, Cause I knew it got me through that. Like it, it really was one of the tricks that and and it was just this um, instinctual thing. I had no plan. It just happened. Yes. I know it got me through. Um, gosh, so many thoughts. I just had a thought as you're uh, talking about, I wonder if we pick partners based on voice sometimes. I had never thought about that. I don't think there's probably studies. I don't know what they are, but I bet there's a subconscious thing of, you know, how there's people we love their voice or their voice really is irritating. I wonder if there's a similarity to a mother's voice in how we choose our partners. I, who it knows? would not surprise right? me at all. It would not surprise me. I have not seen any studies. Yeah, I'm I know, so right? But I'm like, the psychology, <laughs> but I completely agree. These, I, I always have these crazy, curious thoughts. My other thought, as you were talking earlier, was nicotine is an acetylcholine receptor agonist, right? And there's a lot of studies that are coming in out now about ulcerative colitis, and that, those are actually old studies yeah. and, and how nicotine can be helpful. And then long COVID, and I'm yes. like, oh, this is probably a vagal nerve sti stimulation through that yeah. acetylcholine receptor. Now, nicotine is highly addictive. I don't typically prescribe or recommend it, so I'm not recommending that. But there are studies, and it probably makes sense because it's stimulating acetylcholine. Yes, it's the alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor that is particularly the, the receptor that the acetylcholine attaches to, creating the anti-inflammatory cascade. And what's crazy is those are not only located on cell surface, but we've now found that those same alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are found on the surface of mitochondria, which is crazy. If you talk about mitochondrial health and anti-aging, we can do a whole other conversation on that later. I'm blown away because we've always known nicotine's addictive and, and very soothing for people. And um, it's so interesting because I'm like, ah, this makes sense if they are subconsciously creating safety. And again, I am not promoting smoking or nicotine or vaping, but it makes sense of why it's so addictive. In yes, absolutely. Okay. So let's talk about vagal nerve stimulators. So I bought yes. one from Europe a while back. They no longer sell in the US and it would it burned my ear. It was not a good device. I didn't like it. I won't say the name, but um, I ran into you guys at the conference and this is called True Vega. Um, we've right. talked about this because I am so in love with this device. <laughs> we both have our device. Got mine here. <laughs> yeah. So, and I want to tell you it. how you can get one if you want to try this yourself, because I am in love with this. I feel like it's so practical. And it, like I said, yeah. I've tried a lot of other devices. Um, this, maybe you can share a little bit about Gamma Core is the company and they yes. literally design devices for the military. So they are, I think the best research. Do you want to tell us a little background on this? And now this is direct to consumer, so you can get it yourself. Absolutely. The wonderful news with regard to True Vega and Gamma Core and how it all kind of came about is it all started from the idea, and this links back to what you were talking about earlier. There was uh, Dr. Peter Stotz, who is the CMO for the company, um, and JP Erico, my podcast co-host on my podcast uh, called the Health Upgrade Podcast for anybody who's interested. Um, the two of them collaborated on creating vagus nerve stimulation as a tool to help with peanut allergy for Dr. Stotz's son. That's where it all kind of came from. 
the idea, the concept for it. It was piggybacking off of uh, Kevin Tracy's research where he determined that we have this pathway called the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway and that the vagus nerve is the linchpin to creating this inflammatory control within the body. So they went down this road to figure out what's the best way to do this. There had been tools that were implanted and coiled around the vagus nerve, an implanted vagus nerve device. These were used for epilepsy and now they've been uh, used for depression as well, which is quite helpful. And the studies that came from this said, well, what's the best way to get this stimulation to occur in everyday people? And they came down to vagus nerve stimulation. Now there's two forms. You mentioned the ear earlier, auricular vagus nerve stimulation. That covers a very few fibers of the mm -hmm. vagus nerve. Only about 1% of the information on vagus nerve, even less, goes through uh the vagus nerve uh, auricular branch, we can stimulate there. And that's a tool that auricular acupuncture has been used for, but it takes a while for that stimulation to kick in and to take place. So these gentlemen figured, well, this is pretty accessible in the neck. Why don't we do something non-invasive electrical on the neck? Yeah. And so they created this tool where they have these two electrodes that go directly onto the neck on right in front of the uh, SCM muscle and on top of the carotid artery. And let's see what it does. And they went heavy on the research. I promise you, this is the company that's done all the research yeah. to figure out what this tool does. And vagus nerve stimulation has been shown to help with anything leading from depression, anxiety, gastroparesis, inflammatory bowel disease, migraine and cluster headache. It's uh, phenomenal for sleep. Absolutely one of the best tools that I've been able to utilize. And it gets the work, the job done in as little as two minutes of stimulation, which is just phenomenal to understand, right? Two minutes, like who can't give two minutes in the middle of their day or at the end, the book ends at the morning and the evening of their day, or just when they sit down at their desk, which is what I do, because I have it yeah. sitting here all the time. <laughs> I just go and do it when I'm starting my work day or when I'm finishing my work day. And that two minutes helps me get my focus going again. And I can't tell you the number of cases, case studies with my clients that have had just phenomenal changes. All of the exercises and tools that we talked about on this episode are wonderful foundational tools. They're all great. But often when people are in that struggling session, when they're having challenge getting into a state where healing and recovery can truly occur, when the immune system is turned to parasympathetic and recovery state, that signal that's being sent when we electrically stimulate is hyperactivated. It is turned to like level 10 and we're able to put our bodies into a recovery state far more readily. And so people are recovering from like, I, I've had people have phenomenal changes with Parkinson's disease and diabetes and just massive sleep disturbances and gut issues and mast cell activation. It's just been one of these wonderful tools because we can take all the supplements and we can do all of the exercises but if our bodies are not in a healing state in that parasympathetic activated healing state we're not going to be able to do the job of uh, pushing into that healed and healthy area and so that's what this tool really does and two minutes in the morning two minutes in the evening if you need to double it up that's eight minutes total in a day i think that's a pretty low uh, investment of time for a phenomenal potential outcome. Gosh, we've come full circle too, because it's like this simple device that um, heals. And like we said, we can't heal. We already established if we don't feel safe in our system. And this is a way to kind of, the word hack is kind of like anti-aging, right? I don't love that word. Yeah. It's kind of violent for what we're really doing. Maybe we're soothing our system. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But yeah, you guys can get this. And we have a special code for listeners. Um, it's Dr. Jill Plus. It's, it's at truevega.com. So if you guys want to get your own, that's a $30 off coupon, Dr. Jill Plus, and you are welcome to use that if you're listening or share it with your friends. And I just wanted to show you. So there's this app and basically, um, so on my phone, you have an app that's connected to the device. You just go there, make sure it's connected with Bluetooth and then hit go. And then you can turn up the, the uh, stimulation there. And same thing just on, you first spray a little bit of this gel on your neck and then you two minutes and you're done. And like I said, I've been traveling with it. I'm just, I really, really love this. So, yeah, my, so easy. My favorite thing about it is that it's small. Yeah. I can toss it in my pocket when I'm walking around right. a conference. I literally have it in my, my jacket pocket and it's easy to go around with. 
doesn't take up any room in my backpack. Like it's wonderful for, for just being around all the time. Yeah. And one of my cool yeah. uses for this is if I'm traveling across time zones, this yeah. is a great way to get my circadian rhythm back in track and to get myself to sleep at a reasonable time versus uh, what usually happens when I'm traveling to the West coast or East coast. Oh, I love that. Cause I'm all about hacking the time zone stuff. And yeah. then like, I'm, I, I, that's one of my goals is always like, I want to totally like in 24 hours to be on the new time zone. Yes. <laughs> great, great practical. Oh my gosh. I could talk to you forever. Dr. Habib, this has been so, so um, great with information for people. So practical. Um, I want to let people know where they can find you. So be sure and give us, where's your website? Where can your book be found? Just repeat everything. And we'll include this in the notes. If you're driving, don't worry about writing things down. Absolutely. Go to healthupgraded.com to learn more about me and my online practice. I'm in the process of creating a course on the vagus nerve. So look forward to catching that. You can just sign up for emails at this point and we'll get you uh, sent out all of the info when that comes up. And then for the book, go to vagusnervebook.com and there's a bunch of info on there. Uh, Activate Your Vagus Nerve was my first book that actually came out almost five years ago now. Oh, wow. And I've got my second one now, which is Upgrade Your Vagus Nerve. So there's two oh, of them I need to get on a the copy. Vagus Nerve. I'm <laughs> going to get you a copy of this for sure. But both of them are there. I thought you had this one. So no, I'm going to make okay, sure that you right. get it next time. And I'm laughing because you at the conference, so we were at a functional medicine conference in Las Vegas and we've known each other and you've talked about your book before. And so we wanted to do a podcast, but we connected somehow and you pulled it out of your pocket and you showed me. I'm like, oh, I want to know more. I want, I want one of yes. those. I had just had my experience. We won't name any names but it was a trigus here stimulator and it was like 60 minutes and again after like i don't know seven eight sessions my ears started getting burnt and i never noticed a difference so just honestly practically i only talk about stuff i believe in this is a game changer so 100 percent. yeah so truevega.com dr jill plus you can get a discount but most of all thank you for your time today it was an absolute pleasure and thank you guys for joining into another episode of resiliency radio i hope you enjoyed it i always learned so much and i hope you did as well Stay tuned for more empowering episodes. We release a new episode every Wednesday and you can find all of the transcripts and um, historical episodes at jillcarnahan.com. Um, thanks again for joining me today, Dr. Habib. Thank you for having me. It was a wonderful conversation.